I've still got FUD fuck up stuck <laughs> in me. That's what it is. Well, we're back. Power and Speed's Monday night. Power and Speed. <sighs> You'll never hear that in a real podcast. What's that? My fuck up. Uh, it'll be edited out. That's Although right. people listen to the beginning of this and be like, oh, Mike fucked up again. Yeah, but then you could deny it. <sighs> Go back to the tape. Hey, Power and Speed, uh, 908-751-0211. I heard we had a lot of calls when I, when I wasn't here. A few missed. Yeah. But, like yeah a, but, re- record calls? Well, I, don't, I wouldn't know if the, the calls are... <laughs> I mean, it was good. We had, we had a lot of user interaction, yeah, which was good. I like that. Very good. Tad? All right, and like us on the Facebook and the iTunes. And obviously, and I, didn't, I didn't miss Tom very much because he's got <laughs> his iPad or his but phone I, or something repeating us back. You nope. got you got it, buddy? I just shut it all off. <laughs> is that because <laughs> Fudd no, it, Fud was sitting there? It yeah, made it you is, a little stupid. It <laughs> <laughs> it's not my iPad. It's, it's my tablet. <laughs> no, it's different. I it is plain, but. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tad, did you do your like us on all Facebook right. and iTunes? Yes, he I did. did. Yeah, twice. I, I said, you, know, you can call in again tonight, people. We might answer. Yeah, now we'll answer. He was, he was going, like us on Facebook, Facebook, Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Unbelievable. <laughs> well, at least nobody can accuse us of being an overly polished show. <laughs> yeah, really. Scripted, you, rehearsed, <laughs> perfect. You played produced. the wrong intro. I know. <laughs> you can. This is all scripted. <laughs> if you wouldn't have done that, you could really hammer me. <laughs> uh, Shit. So what's up? I don't know. I'm still on Tokyo time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you were gone almost two weeks, right? Yeah, nine days there, yeah. You and your mini two Jay-Zs. Yeah. How, um, how is it over there as a whole? Like, I mean, is it it's pretty cool? Didn't bug you? You didn't feel besides feeling like a giant? I mean, uh, no, you know what? There's regular sized people there. Are there really? Yeah, but that world's most trafficked intersection there that you're at, that would drive me nuts. That was cool. Actually. Yeah. Five, five, uh, directions, people coming. Oh, there's a part of New Jersey like that. Where? Somerville? Five, five points. <laughs> Do people walk across it? Tad, you realize you're talking about shit that nobody here knows about. <laughs> like anybody listening. Has, Does anybody been to Japan besides maybe a J- Japanese listener? No, but I mean, what? when you, know. you compare it to Somerville, dude. Somerville. Not Somerville. Well, didn't you just say Somerville? No, he said Somerville. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Whatever, Tad. All right. He, so, he, uh, he ruined the, Jap- the Japan part, so. <laughs> no, I, I want to talk about that a little more. I mean, was like you were eating octopus and also, oh, I mean, yeah, I ain't but, eating well, nothing yeah, but like I, that. Yeah, but I eat no. that here, so it doesn't really matter. Oh. It's sushi, man. Yeah. Uh. That's Whatever. equally as disturbing. Yeah. But I mean, do they have food for like people that eat like yeah. regular people? Yeah, regular McDonald's? I'll tell you what. Funny you say that McDonald's. <laughs> We're coming out of the train station first day there. And there's a McDonald's right between the train station and our hotel. One of the guys that's been there before says, uh, by the way, you got to try McDonald's. It's way better here. And like, a couple of us are like, how, how could it be better here? Kobe beef? I'm telling you, it's better here. So one day, forget what day it was, a couple of us went. We got a double cheeseburger, fries, and a Diet Coke. And I shit you not, everything's better there. <laughs> the hamburger comes out. You know the pictures that they show? Oh, it looks like Just the like pictures. the picture? And then you get, like here, you get some mashed up thing with a pickle hanging off the <laughs> yeah, side. The, yeah, the cheese is stuck to the cardboard <laughs> yeah, wrapper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. mustard's <laughs> outside the bun. And yep. you, I'm telling you, it looked like the, everybody cares about everything over there. As a people or as no a matter, No matter what their job is. They think it's important. I like, and it is. That, that's. I'm not making fun. I think it's good. Work ethic. Work ethic. Exactly. There we go. Like we have. Like we have. Producing this fine show. Yeah. <laughs> making fuck up yeah, after yeah, fuck up. Yeah, yeah. Leaving our fucking volume on. <sighs> that's, uh, that, that, that was, I, I mean, I would like to go someplace like that, but it's not, I don't have social anxiety. I mean, I'll go anywhere. Wait, I'll, you, I'll go. I'll tell you what, if you ever want to go there, Ted. I would. <laughs> How do you like that? You fucking freak. I, go ahead. <laughs> I would go back there in a second. Would you really? Just to go, if you want to go, just to go. I would definitely go. It's the food's great. The people are great. Language barrier is a little tough, but um, the transportation system is unbelievable. How easy it is. Speed train or no? No, but next year when I go, um, I'm going back for the same thing. But we're going to Osaka for a couple of days. That's where Toyota headquarters is, right? And you take the bullet train to that, you know, 220 something mile an hour train. See, like that kind of stuff I would like, but I just, I'm not a city guy. You know, I'm not like, and, and again, it's not like yeah, social it, anxiety. It's not, like I can't do it, but I just don't like. But it's just something to see. Like well, people. If you, well, if you don't like, <laughs> if you don't like crowds then you wouldn't like the place. Not really so much crowds. I think it's people in general. Well, well that's what well, a crowd you know, is. You know, a certain amount of people create a crowd. <laughs> a crowd. Yeah. You know what I mean? I just, I, I just leave me alone. <laughs> That's why I took great pleasure in just 
while you were gone, I worked on my truck. I just did all the shit. Yeah, I I, you know, I saw that. Ugh. What the hell was that all about? That was Mike being stupid. <laughs> I'd love to tell you it was anything more than that. What, what, what were you trying to do? <sighs> By the way, folks, we're going to have a very highly technical show tonight. <laughs> it's going to start with something about, is that a gas tank problem? Well, it was a fuel tank. Yeah. Petrol tank. All right. Well, that's all right. In, in Ford's high tech. In Ford's infinite wisdom, the trailer hitch on that truck is a blocker beam. Let me take a few steps back. Go. You know, Mike bought the snowblower, right? All excited about the snowblower. <laughs> yeah. Okay. For all this winter that we had. I heard this story. All right. So ahead. the problem is I bought that snowblower to replace the snowblower that I used from my friend. Right. It's a Honda track snowblower, everything else. And it was like a, the, the last digit is like a 32. Sidebar, it's the baddest snowblower you can buy. No, it's not. Cause they got that hybrid one and that looks pretty oh, yeah. badass. I wouldn't right. buy one. Yeah, but that's high. That's one bad. that knows that's where badass, it is. That's ridiculous. Like you, don't need, you don't need a hybrid. No. But anyway, go ahead. No. Next year. So I, I bought that one because I got it. I take care of my mom. Any, any good person. And good son you, you should if your mother needs something you do it for absolutely her. so where she lives they have sidewalks it doesn't matter if you're 50 30 120 if you don't have your sidewalk cleared they don't want to hear it fine they send you a fine really yeah douchebags uh, uh, that's a uh and like they have a certain amount of time <laughs> because god forbid the kids actually have to walk on the street yeah. like i did to get to my bus stop god forbid no, no. get it in front of their house now no. Unfucking, but it, kids don't even walk to their bus stops. Their parents bring them there. They well now now the bus yeah, stops to their house. Yeah, it's yeah, right all up and down my yeah. mom's street. You know what happened to me? You get get to that fucking corner, or and you better be there on time. Yeah, the bus didn't wait. Yeah. Nobody beeped. My mother didn't go on the bus and talk to the bus driver for a half hour while <laughs> you're trying to go get your Sonic Diet Coke and no. fucking jamming it. It's terrible. No, the bus driver was probably having a smoke, saying, "Get the fuck on this bus, <laughs> yeah, kid." That's what I'm it, cold. Yeah. <laughs> Hurry up, you fucking asshole. I want to close the door. Yeah, that's what happens. That's why everybody's pussies now. So, and anyway, I bought the snowblower because my mom was going to get fined if her sidewalk yeah. wasn't done. Last year when we had the big snow, I didn't do the sidewalk because I'm not shoveling the sidewalk. It's not going to happen. <laughs> I know that. Especially when it was that heavy, nasty snow. Yeah, yeah. My friend Junior. Well, like, it matters what kind of snow. You, were, you weren't shoveling it anyway. Well, no, because if it was like puffy snow, it's easy. Yeah, but you, you blow it. A leaf blower? <laughs> yeah. Still in like, the back of the truck. Wow, I that's yeah. great. So- I borrowed Junior's, well, I was going to borrow Junior's track-mounted snowblower. He's a landscaper that we that we know. And he said, don't worry about it. I'll go over. I'll do it for you. He went. He did it. He t he forgot his ramps. He got the thing off the truck on a snowbank. Well, then he couldn't get it back on with snowbank. So he <laughs> left it at my mom's. This is the last year. Yep. It's still there? No, it left today. <laughs> he picked it up today, finally. So I'm looking at this thing. I was like, that's what I need. I got to throw it in the back of the truck. He's got a 32 also? Yeah, that's exactly okay. what it is. Same one. So right. I brought the snowblower back here, so it wasn't sitting at the end of my mom's driveway, you know, all summer, in the back of the excursion. I didn't hear that part of the story. Yes. I got the little ramps that Brian uh, has for his Polaris. Yep. I put the thing down, and the thing just drove right up there like a champ. Now it all makes sense. So what does Mike do? Says, I'm getting my own, because at some point he'll remember I have that thing. He'll want it back. I'll be screwed. Bought my own 1332. 13 horsepower instead of 11. Yeah. How could it be bad? How could it be? And the whole shoot moves on a joystick now and like yep. little Loch Ness monster action on yep. the top. You know, <laughs> everything you got to do. It's got radar. Yeah, I got to see it. Perfect. Drive it up the ramps. Boom. Doesn't fit in a fucking truck. <laughs> they made the fucking thing like an inch and a half taller. Oh what does that have to do with taking the gas tank I, out of the I, I don't know, but it's coming. I'm getting to that. The excursion trailer hitch is so old. That the thing's beat up. It's an alarm. My, my phone is <laughs> making alarmed. noise. Yeah, it's an, it's an alarm yeah. that I had set for something else I got to do. That yeah. I forgot about that now I'm fucked because I <laughs> <laughs> can't do it anyway. And you can't reset the alarm. Nope. So yeah. the, the, the excursion had a trailer hitch on it that's been on there for years. And trailer hitches get shitty. Yep. Yeah. So the inside of the trailer hitch, like most of the rest of the truck, rotted to the point that instead of being two inches inside, was probably like an inch and three quarter. You weren't putting anything in there. And God forbid you did, because it would probably break off. So yeah, I figured, or it'll you know never what? come back out. I'm going to get me a new trailer hitch. I'm going to put a new hitch on it. And then I'm going to get on the back of the truck carrier to put the snowblower on that I bought just to take care of my mom. Yep. Come to find out that the hitch is put on with break off bolts because it was a government mandated blocker beam on the back of the truck. So, oh, so it's part of the structure of the truck. Yes. Oh. So the only way to get the thing off is to take the gas tank out. 
So I figured I'd, I'd run the tank real low. That's a whole nother story. Mm-hmm. Lost <laughs> it by, I, I lo- lost that bet uh, by yeah. about 300 yep. feet. Yep. yep. Dragged it into the shop, took the gas tank out, figured, well, I got the gas tank there. Uh, there's Ford puts little filters in the gas tank. Might as well change them, right? Might as well change them. It's out. And <laughs> just going from there, it was just a train wreck. The thing's heavy. The the bolts, the only good thing is the bolts came out for the gas tank just fine. The big ring that's on the top that holds the sending unit was a motherfucker. Oh, of course. Finally got it off. Got well, those. it's been on since truck's new. Yeah. Well, it's a plastic goofy ring. So this was all done for tr- because I needed to carry the snowblower. For one inch. That's really what it all comes down to. And I, I swear to God, before I did all this, I looked at that snowblower. I said, can I shorten that snout? Is there anything <laughs> I can do to get that thing in there? The answer is no. No. So that, yeah, that's what started the whole trip. So that was a big job. It was a huge job. Probably not for a regular mechanic that does this stuff, but for me, it is. What bolts did you use to, to re-secure that thing? What? The, the new trailer hitch to the, to the beam. Um, believe it or not, those bolts came apart. The, 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 there's a combination of bolts and break-off bolts. The break-off bolts are gone. are gone, but the other bolts are still okay. So we're missing uh, four bolts at this point. But it's enough that the hitch isn't going anywhere. I mean, yeah. I'll put the other two bolts in on each side at some point because the tank will have to come down yet again. To put those bolts in? No, to put the back bumper on because now I've got the nice new hitch and the back bumper's all beat up, so it's got to get a back bumper. But you can't get the bumper off unless you get the tank down. <laughs> wow. I hate this truck. Wow. I hate this truck. You think, no, you actually don't hate it. That's see, why you do all this. Bud might have worked at Ford at that point. But so it's all it's... for my mom. <laughs> That's a good point, Dad. Yep, it's all to take care of my mom. Fud was in... in, in and with Ford. Rear end design, like he designed himself. So at least you got to come home in time to see uh, the inauguration and everything, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was good. How cool was that? Well, he hardly had any people there, <laughs> which kind of sucked. You know? <laughs> I thought it was, was going to be a bigger crowd. And I really did. And then, and then Mike. You mean like the uh, watch on, walk on, March, on Washington the next day? You yeah, guys are yeah, just yeah. trying to get me to lose my shit, aren't you? Yes, we are. I'm not. All right, look, I'm not going to make a big thing out of it. No, go ahead. I'm not. I'm not. I'm just going to say this. Trump won. He Tough did. fucking luck. He did win. And you can minimize it any way you want. But I will say this about the crowds. You know why we weren't there? Because we have jobs. You know, I know why. Bunch of mud. Uh, uh, isn't that funny? Mike and I were just having a conversation about why the people weren't there. And like simultaneously we had, I tweeted yesterday to a bunch of the, the people in charge, you know, why don't you just tell people on the news that, um, we, you know, we couldn't get the day off hashtag couldn't take the day off. You know, that's, that's why there were less people we were working. You know, know what the problem is here is that he's going to be under, I hope he does a good job. He will. I really do. I, I, I hope you're right. And I'm, I am, he did some good shit today already. Well, I am what I would call cautiously optimistic. Me too. I mean, I I, I would hate to think that, you know, I mean, look, you you read, including our own page and like my own personal page, I have friends that are like, oh my God, he did this in 1987 and Uh you people don't realize what he's really, shut up. I mean, if you did any more hand wringing, your fingers would fall off. Yep. It's insane. I wish. And then you got somebody like Madonna. Did you ever see the Big Bang Theory, Tom? A couple, but not really. Tad, have you ever seen it? Yes. All right. That wacko, Sheldon, he got mad at Leonard, and he kept looking at him and putting his fucking fingers to his temple because he was trying to make Leonard's head explode. Yeah, like if all of a sudden there becomes a time when certain people's heads are exploding on TV, it's me, because I could not try any harder if I wanted to to make Madonna's head explode. But I, but you couldn't? No, I, I, I worked on it. Well, I think a lot more people At least you tried, Mike. What is wrong with these people? Tad, give Mike a trophy for trying because in this day <laughs> yeah. and age, everybody gets a trophy, no? I just, I yes. just can't believe it. Why are participant? Dude, why are we going to drag week? You think they'll just give us a trophy just for talking about it? Maybe. <laughs> it's easy, easy nah. way to see car guys aren't like that though, Well, right? then Alan would love it because he's getting a trophy for... <laughs> Do we just have to make the effort? I don't know. Maybe, I mean... Maybe we well, just have to think about it. And look, if my car only went, say, 12-0... <laughs> Yeah. shouldn't we all be on the same playing field shouldn't i have the same advantages i mean look if i don't why don't have- we just complain about the rules <laughs> well you didn't bring a, tr- a spare trans with you so 
Don't even get me started on that <laughs> because I got a little bit of shit even from people that listen. I'm not. Did you hear any of that or no? Yeah, yeah, I saw some of it. I don't. I don't want to bring a lot of parts because I can't work on a lot of the car. It, right. It's a hard car to work. It's Corvette. On. It's, yeah, it sucks. Yep. I mean, I I imagine. Look, a real good Corvette guy could probably get the rear out because he's done it for a living. So I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. All right. I didn't want to look at the chat room, but you know I have to. And they're saying enough with the politics. It's a car show. Yeah. True. Let's talk about car show. Do I have, drag a, do I have a block about? button? Duh. Well, who do you want to block? I, anybody who's fucking with me. <laughs> well, well, Alan. Beware, people. Alan called us idiots. That's right. Talk about, hey, hey pot. Uh, cattle calling. <laughs> Did Alan on there call us idiots? Yeah. It's a car show. Do you, you really idiots. want to fuck with me, Alan? <laughs> After your orientation today? Do you really want to fuck with me? I Total don't think you want to do that. Total failure. Don't. So let's, uh, you had brought up an interesting thing that I said we should talk about at some point. It happened before you left. Go. Uh, with bolts and. Oh, rod bolt thing. Yeah. Now, I mean, this is, how do I say this? I know it's a, it's an experience, something that you went through. Yeah. But we can't, we probably can't get into too many specifics, but. We'll change the names to protect the innocent. <laughs> okay. The. Uh, I've been through this a bunch of times over the years, and we talked about it briefly one day about what you torque with, what material you use. Yep. Do you use oil? Do you use molly? Do yep. you use anti-seize? Yep. And uh, I don't remember what started this conversation again, but somebody had asked me a question about, you know, well, what is the right way to tighten a rod bolt? Mm -hmm. Now. Would you tell them righty tighty, lefty, lefty loosey? <laughs> yes. I did. What else do they have to know? Stretch gauge, mm. angle, mm. torque angle. Mm -hmm. um, How many PSI on your impact gun? I mean, <clears throat> we could we could go down the list of. There's a million ways, and is, man, many of which I don't believe in personally. But the torque angle one always gets me because if you're relying on a very low number of torque to to give you the initial starting point. And then they give you these things that are fantastically arbitrary, like 43 and a half degrees. Yeah. Right, right. So wait a second. You're telling me that the half a degree is a significant it's, it's digit? Now, yeah. Is the end all. But the torque is good enough to get you to a starting point? I, I don't, I don't, I kind of. Uh, yeah, I don't know where that came from. I, I could understand. And like, even the, the torque to yield head bolt stuff that's like from the factories, mm -hmm. I kind of don't get that. Yeah. Because head gaskets are compressing, materials moving. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why you do it in steps. Mm -hmm. uh, I do like a good old click torque wrench. Me too. And I will tell you that until we started using specifically your rods, yep. very rarely did we use a stretch gauge. Yep. Very rarely. Yep. And you know how many bolts and things we've had break? Like next to nothing. Yep. And I think it's all about how your program is. But I'm Well, it's about consistency too. Yeah, you know, which you guys, uh, you had a program to do it, and uh, you didn't vary off of it. No, right? we always did the same thing. Yeah. We always used the same oil yep. until they stopped making it, and then yep. we kind of had to redo our program. We used that that shit from Kendall that was like green maple syrup. Yeah, yep. <laughs> Good. Well, I mean, we had you know, <laughs> can't say <tell you> this, <laughs> fucking idiots. Um, circle track guy came in. He's like, yeah, I brought motor oil so you can die to my motor, mm -hmm. and it's like Kendall. Like, if, I don't even know if it was 2050. I think it was like straight 50. Uh, yeah, straight weight. And of course, if you're dynoing a motor over the winter, that means it's cold outside. Sure. So the guy brings the oil in out of his truck. My <laughs> father takes the cap off and turns it over. And it was like, it was like the mobile one commercial. It like what even, happened? Yeah, it pour. And my father's like, you use this? And the guy's like, yeah, it's great. My dad's like, for what? God. <laughs> but that's what they use. Yeah. yeah. But ironically it worked out to be a very good assembly loop for like torque and bolts and everything it was always consistent it yep. always worked well and i mean hell he brought a case of it we had that for <laughs> a <Forever>. long time <laughs> you were using it on dyno that's for sure right but i always torqued like those little rod bolts what did what were they supposed to be like 52 to 54 yeah i mean yep. i must have done god tons and tons you talking that. about sportsman rod yeah because eight steel, yeah you think about bearing clearance torquing yeah. going together torquing yep. coming apart for a rebuild checking bearing clearance again torquing yeah plus all times we did it yeah yeah i mean it's uh, and i used a torque wrench now i'm not saying that a stretch gauge is not what you should use but m my question with the stretch gauge what always bothered me yep and this is maybe a more of a mental thing mm -hmm. which is kind of the the problem you had 
that if you're going to stretch a bolt mm-hmm. and the bolt says, okay, I had a stretch eight and a half, mm-hmm. let's say that was a number mm-hmm. and every bolt felt like it took X amount of effort to stretch eight and a half. And then that one bolt felt like it had a stretch. Oh, I don't know what uh, a quarter of the effort. Then what? How do, how do you feel about that? Yeah. Bad bolt, you know. Well, you have to, um, first of all, you have to rely on something. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the principle that we found uh, with stretching is because torque wrenches are never right. Mm-hmm. Never. Like, never, ever. Mm-hmm. So wait we, a minute. Wait a minute. I just got to brought a brand new one for Harbor Freight. Yeah. It's like, from Harbor that, Freight? You're yeah. trying to say that thing's no good? Yeah. You, you, you're better off hitting that with a hammer and it's, it'd be better. Mm-hmm. No, it's not that they're not good. It's just that they're not right. They're not correct. Mm-hmm. I've never seen one. Never seen one correct. But it's not, it, it's kind of like any other tool. It's sort of like even a dyno. Well, here's the thing. Exactly. So here's the, here's the thought process. So we buy this zillion dollar torque wrench. Te- we qualify our torque wrenches every day. Mm-hmm. Wow. And because you have to. And um, so an engine builder can't do that. So why would you not take a torque wrench? Mm-hmm. And put 50 pounds on it. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter if it's 50 or not, if you're going for stretch and you prepare your, your bolts and your lube the way it should be. And you pull them one sweeping, smooth pull. Mm-hmm. None of this 10, 20, 30, everybody used to say that. You know how many times I've seen people do that? Oh God. And they don't understand that every time you, you stop the bolt, you have to, you have to start yeah, breakaway, yeah. right? Breakaway toy is it. But people will argue, oh, no, you got to snug them to 35. I believe the number from ARP is if you are, if you exceed 35% total, you need to loosen the bolt and start over. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so you're at 50. It doesn't matter what torque wrench is. You pull it up and you're supposed to be 5.8 to 6.2 or whatever, and you're Mm 5.5. So you loosen it. You make sure there's lube under the head. Mm -hmm. If you want, you can put more oil on the threads, whatever you want to do. And you change it to 53. Again, it doesn't matter if it really is 53 or 57 or 90 or, well, you know, within reason, it's not 90. You pull it and you're in your range. Now you know that that torque wrench on that day with that lube should pull all those bolts. Well, so you've got, <clears throat> and, and even from the engine assembly side, mm-hmm. um, you're right. You could do one because you're working with one motor. You've got new rods just came out of the box mm-hmm. for you as a manufacturer. You're... All the rods have all the same machine work done, Mm -hmm. all the same tolerances should be kept, Mm -hmm. finishes, everything should be pretty close. So, yeah, I I agree with that. Why would it be different for an engine builder? I guess it wouldn't be, but I mean, like- No, it would be more consistent for an engine builder because, well, here's the thing, and here's what I've always said. You can take any rod bolt, as long as you know what the manufacturer wants for stretch, Mm -hmm. you can take any lube that you have, Mm -hmm. and I mean any, you know, 30 weight, 20 weight- um, anti C's, which you got to be careful with, or, or the crazy lubes that, you know, the ARP mollies or the real slippery stuff, you really got to be careful with them. Cause you'll, 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 uh, over tighten a bolt, mm-hmm. you know, exceed tensile and, um, you know, you'll deform it anyway. So any lube, any wrench, and you could work your way into being accurate by using stretch. Yeah. Using your brain and using the right tools. Right. And, and I, I would tend to agree with that, but it is unnerving because I, I did have it happen. Um, let me give you an example, like you're checking rod bearing clearance and you want to, you want to shoot one rod to figure out what gets you where you got to be. You got to mm-hmm. split shells. You got to go with H's. You got to mm-hmm. go with federals, you mm-hmm. know, coded, non-coded, whatever nines, it is, tens, yep. whatever. Yeah. Yep. So you're jerking around, you know, I might take that rod apart three or four more times. Yep. Well now like your number of torque, because you use that rod and everything's a little more burnished because mm-hmm. you're talking to yep. Now that one rod could be goofy. Right. But I guess what you're saying is it makes sense, too. It could be goofy if you torque it, too. Right. I, I don't know. I mean, very rarely did I use the stretch gauge. And, I mean, uh, I'm sure people would look at that and be like, oh, my God, how could you not? But I just, we never did. Well, you know, there's fudge factor built into the bolts. Um, fudge factor? No. No, not. There's never any idiot factor built in, built in. But there's, you know, there is some leeway on both sides of the stretch. I mean, I know that. You know, if you pulled, if you, if you were supposed to be five, eight to six, two, and, and you got everything to five, seven, mm-hmm. nothing would happen. Or you, if you were at six, three, it'd be fine. I wouldn't, I would personally still get them in the range, but there's some, there's obviously some, uh, some space on each side, but I, I couldn't imagine. 
especially as a, a, a guy who doesn't do a lot of engines, I couldn't imagine doing anything other than stretch. Right. Now, bringing up the Kendall, you know, green maple syrup. Can I say one more thing? Yes. One of the advantages guys like you have and all engine builders have is they do it a lot. Mm -hmm. So you get a feel. A feel for yes. it. Yes. Like I've, I've, I've torqued enough bolts that, you know, I can feel something getting loose, getting better. Yeah, and you, you also you also know if something's well. I I think anybody that's done any mechanical work knows something when the isn't bolt, right when yeah. the bolt went past its point of no return. Yeah, yeah, like you feel something before you end up breaking mm -hmm. or you you rip threads out mm -hmm. or whatever. I mean, I remember a guy that uh that actually you know the Chevy cam bolts mm -hmm. twenty two foot pounds would be like a an aftermarket one. Who could have done that? I tried to torque one to 55 <laughs> and broke the thing off in a camshaft. Come on. Tell me who could have done that. I don't, I don't want to get the guy. Come on. I, I tell me who would have done that. FUD. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he, he was, he was granted younger. So I, I would guess. Inexperienced? I would say maybe a little, a little more dense than he was. But wow. I remember, see like that mechanical feel. If somebody told me that bolt was 55, not only would my brain have taken over and said, well, that bolt shouldn't be 55. Look at the size of the thing. Right. But I mean, as soon as you, unless you just started honking on it in one big giant motion and just ripped the head off. Which is what you would do. You'd know that, that there's no way that is. Yeah. But the, the, the feel is important, but what else is important is being consistent. That's why I brought up the Kendall. When we had that Kendall stuff there, we had it for a long time. Mm -hmm. It was the same oil. Mm -hmm. from the same batch. Mm -hmm. It was the same everything. Now, you uncovered something that wasn't any fault of yours, but a lube that was inconsistent. Mm -hmm. How did well, that? I mean, I didn't uncover it. I was involved in it being uncovered, but we had a customer that had a really, it's funny how this is going to play into this whole story that we just talked about. Um, he's got an engine assembler who's done a lot of motors. He's done a lot. He's torqued a lot of bolts. Mm -hmm. And he called the owner one day and said, listen, uh, these bolts don't feel right. They feel spongy. Mm -hmm. And they started getting erroneous numbers. And, and the method that they did uh, was different. It was fine, but it was different than, than what I do. Um, and I'm not trying to say it's a, a different bad or different anything. It was just different. Mm -hmm. So I went down there and did some stuff my way and um, couldn't prove their numbers but didn't you know wasn't saying they were wrong didn't disprove it we just had to continue on right and this went on for about five days and this is a guy that does a lot of engines and he can't have these problems so um every time we tested something at manly we you know we qualified a rod bolt i mean the uh the the torque wrenches and we were getting exact numbers mm -hmm. we, had, we actually had the head of the rod department doing this and he has torqued he's worked his way up he, he's not some engineer that we hired he's the guy that started the rod department he's probably torqued more rods than any <laughs> engine builder you could ever maybe possibly all find. of them i mean he <laughs> might have torqued a million rod bolts uh, maybe not a million but he's torqued thousands and thousands right and he was getting numbers like they were supposed to be five eight to six two or whatever it was five five to six five and he was getting six at like six oh six oh six oh and we, you know, I know, we know this engine builder and they know their shit. Mm -hmm. So we know something's going on, but we don't know what, and they don't want to hear that. You don't, you don't know what they need an answer because yeah. every day it goes by, they're not building engines. You know, it, it, it's a bad situation. And, and the guy who torqued all the rod bolts called me like six o'clock one night and he's like, you're not going to believe this. He's like, uh, we got bad lube from XYZ lube company. And I'm like, wow, bad lube. He says, yeah, it's just not consistent. And he proved it out. Uh, there were certain tubes that were bad. They qualified the date codes. They pulled them all off. We ordered five pound cans. But of, you see, in that case, the guy's feel actually made, screwed this up. Yeah. Because that's why he found it. Yeah. If he didn't have the feel, if he was just the, the boob that says, you know, do this. Okay. Yeah. Probably would have never known. Yep. Yep. But it was a, a crazy situation. And then you and I were talking before about, well, you know, how do you figure that stuff out? How do you, like, what if there was a problem with the alloy in the rod bolt? Then what? Well, see, that's why stretch kind of bothered me. And that might have been, hmm, where did that come from? What, stretch? No. Somebody planted in our heads 
that after you torque these bolts enough time, mm-hmm. you know, enough times, like if you're doing like pre-assembly work, mm-hmm. bearing clearance work, you could anneal the rod to the, the bolt to the right. point where you shouldn't use it. Um, I don't know that. Uh, I, I don't know who would have said that. And uh, I, it was a rod company. Well, it might have been Oliver because Ooh. they, they were. They, Ooh, I didn't Ooh. say it. Did I say that word? Yes, you did. <laughs> yeah, I actually didn't mean that. But they had their WSB. Well, they had a lot of rod bolt problems, and I'm not hacking on them. Right. They just did. Yeah. And I'm and you you talk to any remember the Northeast that tri track Pennsylvania deal? Yeah. Th- there were guys there that were scattering stuff every week because of that. And um and they don't make the bolts, so you know, just it's it's not them. But um I there are rod bolts, like specifically a car bolt, that I don't know if you could torque them enough times to hurt them well what what i always because i i had that in my mind that the bolts could get funny or you know get to the point where they're worn out i mean maybe if a guy's a a ham fisted and over torquing them every time he puts a motor together yeah yeah. well if you over torque if you over torque it once it's bad well i'm sure there's people that you know just don't the mic i'm sure there's people (laughs) that that look at a torque spec let's say it says uh 48 to 56 Yep. There's got to be people that like, well, I got to make it tight. Let's make it 56. Six, well, there's yeah. a reason there's a range. Right. And generally speaking, I would like to be right in the middle. In the middle. Right. That's, that's what most people. But I think. do know people that say, what does that say? 65 to 75. Okay. 75 it is. Must be better. It's not better. No. But I mean, it's conscientious about well, doing this. How but, many people you have that I've done it enough times I'm or make it 80 just to make sure. And then they Well, that, those are people that don't know. Those anything. are people yeah. I've, I've had those people too. And I, you know what else I've had? I've had the people that think that the click of the torque wrench should happen twice. Oh, the click. click you click, ever click. see those guys? Yeah. That, that was always one to bring up. Uh, there, there's a story about that too. A guy was working on his own motor at the shop in front of my brothers and he goes, put a head on. And he's going to torque the head, mm-hmm. and I watch him, and I, I said, run him up to, like, you know, do, do him in steps, run him down to, like, you know, 25, and then we'll go to, there was Ford, like, half-inch head stud, big, stupid mm-hmm. things. And I said, and then run him up to, like, you know, 60, and then go right to your 90 or whatever. So I watch him do the first 30, and I'm like, the hell's he doing? Because he's just turning the thing. And then the wrench clicks, and he keeps going. I'm like, uh-huh. dude, what are you doing? It's got to click twice. The second click you were going to hear is when the fucking bolt broke. Yeah. You nitwit. And hit the ceiling. And then you've got guys that use the electronic torque wrenches that beep. Yep. Yeah. Listen, I don't care how good your beeper is. I don't care how good your ears are. To me, I would never use one of those things. You have no real feedback. You know, I feel the same way, but I will tell you, and I was stunned when I heard this. Um, we thought they were crazy because the ones they make now, they beep, they have lights, they have fireworks. Go on. It's crazy what goes on, right? Ding, ding, ding. They electrocute you. There's all kind of shit that happens. That's what ARP uses. He's, they say mm-hmm. that they're the most accurate ones. Jeff Chang said it too. But I, yeah. I can't buy that because, it, well, let's put it this way. I mean, I know they do. If you're, if you're a very accomplished torker, <laughs> I mm-hmm. guess would be the term, mm-hmm. that because I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people like they're pulling a wrench and they've got like a jerky motion going on. And then, well, that's a problem, right? Well, now. you're slowing down, you're speeding up. Well, that's why I think that beep thing I could see. I mean, I'm for, agreeing with you. Yeah, I know. I, I like a clicker. I could never use one. I, I use snap on click type, yeah. you know, spin the handle and drive the thing up and down, yep. lock it in place. Yep. And that's what I've always used. And shut it off at the end of the day. It's another thing people forget. Yeah. Un- unload them. Unload them. You leave a torque wrench loaded, and and it, you left them loaded. Yeah. Well, yeah, see, I know. well, it doesn't matter if you stretch bolts, but yeah, it over time they get. You know how many times I sent that stupid torque wrench back to snap on, and it's fine. I tell you, never got that one back because the guy. And, and, and well, the the guy had the the tester on a truck because mm-hmm. they were selling, you yep. know, a calibrator. Yep. It had been probably two years, and I guarantee you that thing was never turned to zero. Not a chance because I never did it. I don't remember. My well, did you turn it down? I mean, I don't think they t- 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 Well, not only zero. that, we're building small block Chevy, so it's not like something's going to be at 150. Yeah, you're at 50 pounds. You know, 50 pounds. What's the most you're going to have? Like head bolts, uh, 65 and 70. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's kind of kind of where you're at. Yep. Uh, but we, I mean, they checked that wrench and it was fine. But the, this, the, the reason to bring all this stuff up is because, like, it seems like it's more about your brain and how you do stuff. Because mm-hmm. somebody had asked me about engine building tools. Like, what do you need? Like, what are the, th- where are the things I should spend money? You know, where are the places I should spend money? Yep. Um, begrudgingly, I would tell you probably a stretch gauge because you don't do it every day. Yep. If it's not something you do every day, it's probably not a bad idea. Even if you just use it on your first rod to make sure you're okay. Um, 
a good torque wrench, as you know, I think anybody could gather from what I said, stay away from the beeping ones. I mean, for me, especially if you don't do it every day. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess ARP differs with me. Well, that's fine. They probably torque more rod bolts than me, but whatever. They probably do. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess that's what you used to. Do you ever balance rod bolts? God. <laughs> Sorry. But do you, I mean, do you really, I mean, people do come up with all that stupid stuff. Yeah, I know. You and, ever have things sent back for a gram out? I, mean. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. I, I wouldn't want to be in Tom's position. But yeah, the rod bolt thing, the stretch and everything else. I, I mean, maybe that cleared some things up for people that had never, you know, really sat down to look at an engine, you know, or, or to build mm -hmm. an engine that are like, well, because I mean, especially like when you took, I remember we asked Oliver for a stretch number and they didn't want to give it to us. Mm. Really? Yeah. They wouldn't give it to us. Maybe, we, they, weird. They, maybe they didn't know it. We wanted a torque or a stretch and they didn't want to give us anything. They said, you got to do it our way. And my father had a lot of reasons and a lot of points that he didn't like that particular method. And they just, they never wanted to do it. I think now they've kind of. Well, they do an angle or no? Yeah, it's all angle. Uh, hmm. It was like 30 foot pounds. And like I said, some yeah. relatively, you know, arbitrary degree. I mean, I'm sure there's a reason for it. Arbitrary right. probably isn't the right word, but it's weird. Like 43 and a half. That, that half, where does it come from? You know. Significant digit. I don't know. Does that mean it? 44 year you've, you've overdone the bolt it, yeah and then where do you get that half i mean if i remember the the um the gree wheel on those things that whole about, thing's yeah. clapped out at the beginning yeah i mean the it's like three inches fucking, in diameter right? even if you got a perfect brand new snap on socket the fucking thing wobbles around you got a fucking it wobbles pointer. a degree yeah you get you had to you had to like take the slack out of it yeah and then you got this little like finger that has a thumb screw that you got to jam against something to hold it it's just it was stupid and you got a two inch diameter degree wheel yes which, which i remember you the tech. degree wheel on your engines doing camshafts it was like three foot in diameter <laughs> yeah. yeah that's what you need i know to, to, to me to be accurate well they're anal like that so he said anal yes I, I mean that's if you're doing it right that's what you need but yeah i agree with you on the torque angle thing so yeah. all right well i i, I wanted to bring that up because people actually brought up <coughs> excuse me about uh engine building and and rod bolts and degreeing camshaft. So I, I don't know, like Alan had said the other day when he texted me, he's like, you should have more technical discussions. Well, I can't tell somebody what size turbocharger to use. I can't. Yeah. Uh, I can't tell somebody whose brand of fuel pump is good. It changes every day. Yeah. I can tell you from a basics and a foundational standpoint, what would be good and what would be bad and proper ways to do things. But that's, that's about the most I can offer whenever we well, talk you about could tell stuff. people how to build engines okay. and, and you could certainly give advice on camshaft and stuff like that well it was really nice because a, a good friend of mine uh listened he listened to episode 54 Four, yeah which and and he wrote something like that was amazing and it was keith from total sale yeah <laughs> that, i mean see that makes me yep. feel good because yep. and i could give you all the opinions i had on piston rings and a lot of them were right but even me talking to keith i had some the, different opinions that the new flexible rings are great you know to learn that well yeah but that kind of stuff but like listening to things uh i don't know like what the rings take to break in right. how they work Th those are all things that uh, i think some of this is going to be opinion there is a right way and a wrong way just like with the rods there's you could torque you could stretch you yep. can you there's a lot of ways to get there but you know well you I, found out the wrong way the one time with the uh synthetics and you couldn't get the rings to see to that was a really strange deal and i i would i would i would hesitate to even tell that story because that was something we tried to make better and it mm. was par partially Pork. ours yeah. trying to make it better. <coughs> and we just, we failed yeah, you horribly. Should, should the bet on that. Yeah. We should have just went with what we were using and not tried to make an improvement when a guy needed his motor like tomorrow. <laughs> it was, and it was, that was just breaking. I never heard that story. Yeah. You never heard that story? No. What did you think it was going to be better by breaking in on, on synthetic? Um, no, it wasn't broken in on synthetic. There was, I can't remember what the whole story was. I, I think Tad has half of this right. Tad? I just know that some a problem with the There's so heating. The, the things that I can tell you about, the things we found on the dyno. Was it overheated or something? Or no, no? I, I can't remember what it was, but I think what it came down to <clears throat> is the hone wasn't aggressive enough to break in an extremely hard ring. That's what I think it was. And, you know, I talked to Keith. You heard our assembly method. Bores wipe down, you know, till they're bone dry yeah. and clean with lacquer thinner. That's what we always used. Mm -hmm. um, 
small amount of oil <clears throat> on the assembly tool, a mm-hmm. little bit on the skirt, mm-hmm. knock the piston. In. That's it. Mm-hmm. Like none of this. And the paper towels with no lint. <laughs> yeah, no lint towels. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, none of this bullshit of oh, transmission fluid or, you know, no offense to Keith. I'm not knocking yeah. the product. It probably helps. But ring break and lube, you know, none of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Never had a problem. You know, I, I got a couple of those boxes, of those lint freed towels. Mm-hmm. I have to hide them myself because my father takes them off to clean off his bicycles and stuff. I'm like, yeah, no, paper towels. That's not what that is for. Get a paper towel from the used kitchen. Used to make me crazy yeah. when, like, you know, somebody would use them as like napkins. Yeah, it's like no, Ugh, nuts. No. Yeah, but th- those rings we put a, a hard style. It was it was some kind of coated ring, oh. and it never broke in. Yeah, it never it never seated. And let me tell you, when that when that really doesn't happen. Like everybody talks about the dyno, like you're running a motor and you see a little blow by and it gets a little better, a little better, a little better. Let me tell you, when they're bad, you know they're bad mm-hmm. because you'll have a little bit like at part throttle, you know, just having a thing like specifically cam breaking and you'll see just wisp out of the valve cover. Well, when you have one that isn't right and you get on the throttle and it intensifies, you'd really like to hope that that's going to go away after like a pull or two. I've never had that happen. Yeah. That thing was not, and we took it apart. We puffed it. We put it back together again with those rings. Did the same thing. Wow. In the end, had a punt, went back to a regular Molly top, started right up, yeah. cleared right up. They'll come in with anything. Motor was perfect. Yep. Why did you want a coated ring in the thing? Oh, just trying to make it better? You don't remember that story? No, boy. I don't. Who is, who is it for? Uh, I believe. John John or no? It might have been Jack. Might have been Jack Swain. We might have been trying to make it just a customer. I mean, nobody, mm-hmm. nobody else there knows. Mm-hmm. But he was, uh, we, we wanted to make something better. And I don't know why we ended up with those rings, but that was honestly the first time that I had any experience talking to Keith, trying to figure out what was going on. Yep. But yeah, it was, it was home. And, you know, like, but we talk about weird things that you see and weird things that you have happened that there's really no answer for. I, I, we talked about this a little bit today. I had one two barrel motor and I know Tattle is like, oh, Mike and his two barrel motors. I did a lot of them so you know yeah. exactly how they should all be. Yep. Did I have flat tap it? Uh, yeah, all flat tap it stuff. So I had one of those motors that no matter what happened, no matter what happened, it had main bearings that needed to be at damn near four. Yep. If they were under four, they'd get hot. If they'd see the oil temperature come up on a dyno, you take it apart and the bearings are really beat up. Yep. And opened them up, opened them up. It ran, it worked, <laughs> never figured out why. Change a crank, same thing. So it wasn't the crank. How to be block moving around. Yeah, but right? how do you tell a customer? I told you this today. How yeah. do you tell a customer, hey, look, man, you got to buy a, buy a new $1,500 block and <clears throat> you know another 500 in machine work. Can't do that. Right. Um, I had the one two-barrel motor. Guy wore out valve springs every year, shot. When we used the, the PSI, uh, I think it was a, Inch 460 spring. Yep. Two years on him. Everybody. Except this one guy. 30 pounds down. Beat up. Yep. Valve seats beat up. Ugly. Everything beat up. Yep. Same head, same valve, same spring, same retainer, same lock, same rockers, same push rods, same cam, everything. I figured it was the guy. Out of control. Mm. No feel. Mm-hmm. Foot to the wood in the middle mm-hmm. of the corner, spinning the tires like an idiot. Yep. Floating it all the time. Sold the motor to another one of our customers. So this guy had a spare motor. Um, same thing. Two different guys. Crazy. Never figured it out. It would have been nice to figure that out. Yeah, we were talking about that before. Like maybe it was lift or angle, you know, shit that you didn't think about back then too often. Mm-hmm. You know, hitting the ramp at the wrong side. Who knows? But that would have been good to figure out. And then you've got the other side where something's just magic. Right. And you, I mean, if there's, I mean, look, you'd like to find out why the bad ones are bad, but you'd really like to find out why the good ones yeah, are bad. Yeah. Yeah. Because you could do that all the time. And this happens to this day. Yep. With pro stock guys. We'll yep. have one that's just real good. Yep. And they don't know why. Like 10, 12 better. Mm-hmm. And they call it Bertha. They all name that one Bertha. <laughs> I don't know why. Or Honey Boo Boo. But, but all that, all that kind of stuff, that's my experience. That's what I can tell people about. But I, I certainly don't want to recommend camshafts to people or or tell them you know exactly what's right there's certain guidelines that everybody's going to fall in for bearing clearance for procedures for torque and rods mm-hmm. but there are right and wrong ways like there's right ways to clean stuff there's wrong ways to clean stuff mm-hmm. but i mean like for the people that want technical stuff from me probably not so much 
I can I can answer questions and tell you opinions, but I'm not going to do it. Actually, you know what? One, fun, not not along those lines, but a uh, new funny thing that Matt Happel, mm-hmm. the sloppy mechanic, has found. Mm-hmm. I see a lot of people on his page are talking the same thing. They boost the hell out of the motor. I mean, he's getting over a thousand horsepower out of a stock, you know, six. I th- think it was a six liter motor. And all of a sudden, boom! He lifts a head, you know, a head, and he gets a knock. And the knock isn't what you normally think that you spin a bearing, you hurt a bearing. Doing it because he's squishing the rods, they making them go wonky like Jeff. And the, the rods are hitting the crankshafts, and a whole bunch of guys are showing where the crankshafts got all shined up from the piston hitting it. So it's like now it's a new boost. Oh, he's bending boost. them, bending them fore and aft. Yeah, it's because he's he's going thirty something psi, and you know the rod comes down enough that it starts hitting the crank, and it's like wow, that's the new problem. It's not the bearings aren't wrong; it's the freaking rods. Well, what was what was hitting the crank? The bottom of the piston. Bottom of the piston's hitting the crankshaft. Yeah, Jeff didn't have that, because that's one of the first things I look for. Really? Yeah, yeah, I, I look for that. Well, was Jeff's just so bent out of shape? I have. I still to this day don't know what that thing was hitting. Or, or, I mean, trust me. when it was can, making noise, you said. When, listen, making noise, I could hear it over the cell phone yeah. when he started it. That's yeah, making noise. That. Yeah. Well, we heard it on my Subaru, too, because I swear that's what it is. Well, the, the sloppy mechanic is a good example, you know, Matt. Right. Is a good example that not everything needs to be perfect. Right. To make good numbers and survive. And there, there are a lot of ways to get from point A to point B. I mean, for sure. What are you laughing at? Paul, you just tech, just sent me a message. <laughs> well, let's let's talk about Paul real quick too. <laughs> just so just so you know how funny this is going to be. Yeah, he he, he messaged me today. Uh, what the fuck are we going to talk about? <laughs> so I said I said you know injectors and such, suspension if you like, injector dynamics. He's he just texted me. This is all day. I get nothing. He sends me a text. Says philosophies, the dangers of collectivism. That cocksucker marks. <laughs> God. He's going to be a good guest, man. Is that going back to political? Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, mean, we wanted we wanted to have him on on Monday, and we actually kind of had that for, for tonight. Yeah. We actually kind of had it planned for tonight. I think he actually confirmed for tonight. Yeah, but I, bl- I, I blew that because I was away. But one thing that I think that we need to do, and, and it's nobody's fault but our own, um, we need to make sure that the show is publicized and listed for probably more than like the day we're going to do it. Yeah. Like an hour. Yeah. 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 See, He's a big guest. Yeah. And, and a lot of people have asked for him. I, I have a million questions on injectors. Yep. A million. Hey, just so you know, I don't know if you're reading what's going on. And no, one of our guys just asked if we could talk about static and dynamic compression ratio, which is something you also know a lot about. And, uh, when it comes to camshaft profile, idle vacuum, that kind of stuff. That, that, th- that's a good subject, actually. It, it is probably a good subject. Too much but time for that. You know another thing that I fear? This um, is like, sonic closing? <laughs> that's, a, that's a big one. That's a big one. Where would I find my women? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but what another thing that I fear is that somebody asks something like this, like, well, what do you, you know, static and dynamic compression, you know, why, why do you use what you use? What, what does what affect? And Mike gives an answer, and then I get, you're wrong. You're a jerk off. <laughs> oh, you mean engine, from, engine like, building 101? So, Maybe well, rod bolt stretch. May, but not only that, I, <clears throat> l- listen, unlike our friend, Alan, the engineer. Your friend. Self-proclaimed genius. <laughs> <laughs> self-proclaimed genius. I am not a, a college educated man. I man. That's why I voted for Trump, of course, because I'm just stupid. Right. I'm walking you're deplorable. Around, I'm right. walking around breathing through my mouth, scratching my balls all day. That's all I do. I, I That's don't. That's all I do too, actually. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I, I don't think that, that I would be, I have, hmm, how do I say this? Don't know. Okay. Why did they figure out that, or they think that the son was a God because they didn't understand it? You know, like people from years, you know. His uh, name is Ra. Well, you know what? Okay, whatever. Exactly. But why did you come up? We we all know now the sun's not a god. And if any of you people listening are flat earth people, just please go out in the backyard Well, I was just about to bring that up next. The sun's not a god? Stop. Oh, sorry. You can sail off the edge of the earth and fall to the sun. People see something that they can't explain, so they struggle to explain it, and they come up with, with a reason and a theory. I have my reasons, my theory, on why dynamic compression matters why camshaft overlap center line all that matters am i a college educated engineer no but i can tell you my practical experiences and why well i think that's all they want you know these guys i don't know i forget who who wrote that 
Um, I th- he looks like a new guy to me, but you know, maybe he doesn't know anything about it and he's asking for, for some kind of maybe just direction. Look, the best thing I can tell everybody is that camshaft events drive this whole system. Sure. They drive everything. Yes. They and do. a perfect example of that. And the easiest way I was always told by a, a couple smart people, my father included, if you were, if you were trying to figure out the effect that a change would have, don't make a little change, make a big change. And the big change will tell you the general trend, unless you overshot it and then got the opposite. But I mean, it's like if you're trying ignition timing, do you put in one degree? No, put in two. Right. You know, so or maybe even three, four. See what you got. Then if And you, then you can continue onward or backward. And then define your right. number down. But right. I mean, anybody that says, well, you know, what do you run on a small block Chevy? Well, I'm running 32. Well, let's put, you know, 30. 50 in it. No, you wouldn't do that either. No, but you wouldn't put 33 in it. Exactly. If, if you're testing. So what a lot of people did it, years ago was they made 383s or, or they put a 406 in and mm-hmm. they wanted to make a nice street car. So mm-hmm. they put a stock cam in it mm-hmm. and the thing would ping like fucking mad. Mm-hmm. Yep. Why? Because the cam is too small and dynamic and, compression, and dynamic compression. Yep. yep. If you have too small a cam, too big a motor, and that's probably a big portion of why a larger displacement motor likes a little more camshaft. Sure. Because they can. Yeah. Because they can. It's, it's really simple. Pretty much all it comes down to. Yep. Now, there's a whole nother side to that because if you scaled everything exactly the same, that might not be the case. Well, why don't, let's just let's speak on that for one second. Okay. You know, when you have a larger compression, I mean, a larger displacement engine, the event physically takes longer. True. So every event that the camshaft is controlling is changed via that you know, the amount of time that the, the combustion event takes. Mm-hmm. And that's why it would make a bigger cam seem smaller fair point so no i just i, I but wasn't say you're college educated no well, yeah but that doesn't matter <laughs> that's a torque ratio uh, but. no I, I wasn't saying that to make any point for or against what you're saying i was saying that to maybe clarify it to somebody who who doesn't realize why we just said that sure and there's there's other sides to that when people made bigger motors out of standard stuff um if you took a, I don't know, like you had a set of 283 heads. Would you want to put them on a 400? No, you're going to make something that peaks torque at 1900. Right. I mean, that's what happens. Things, you know, proportion's important. But not to mention F40 HCC, you know, change yeah, or something good. like that. Yeah. Need a 95 cc dish. <laughs> the, the, the idea of camshaft event, the event based on obviously the, the style of motor you're working with, the size of the motor you're working with will dictate how the motor's power curve shows itself in conjunction with everything else. But see, this is the problem. It's a, it's a, a long list of variables. Like if you had a motor that had a gigantic cylinder head and you <clears throat> settled on your ideal camshaft for all the other motors you did, but now you put this giant head on the, no, it's not going to profile right. the same. It's all different. But what you're doing is you're changing the event to affect essentially dynamic compression. That's mm-hmm. really what it comes down to. And why do you think we're talking about cylinder pressure gauges and everything else? Mm-hmm. I mean, that all analyzes everything up to and including the event. Yep. And and that's that's about the best I can tell you. Could I tell you a number um, that like what you would actually look for in peak cylinder pressure as far as dynamic compression? No. No, I well, can't. Well, that difference that that differs in everything. No, yeah, I know, but but I'll tell you this. I know a lot of awful smart guys <laughs> that got it. I as soon as I said that, I can think of three or four <coughs> of them that had the world by their balls, uh, by the balls, they brought in spreadsheets and graphs, and this is the calculation I used for this and this and this. And my father would look at it and be like, that's no good. <laughs> and the guy's like, no, this should, by my calculations, it should make, you know, 650 horsepower by 7,800. <laughs> my dad would be like, never happened. Well, no, no, you know, and they'd argue that why their math was sound. And they'd be wrong. And the dyno. Never lies. That's why I was always so leery. And this is, this would be a person I would love to get on. If you know a guy that does this, a guy that writes engine software. Oh, like Blair or somebody like I, that? I don't even know those guys because well, every one of them. Well, Blair's dead. But well, he, he, he'd be a little tough to get. He'd be, he would be tough, yeah. We couldn't pay him enough. Uh, I don't know anybody who writes that kind of software, but some of those guys are brilliant. And, and that whole deal has come. Yeah, but come. there's a bunch of smart guys that can't turn a fucking doorknob. I agree that. I, I agree with that. But I will tell you that that science has come a long way. 
I hope so. No, it has. It definitely has. And I'm not saying that they could walk in with a spreadsheet and, and nail your father down within five horsepower and, or be righter than him because you know how I feel about your father. Sure. He's one of the smartest guys I've ever met. But I mean, it's, it's again, it's- And it's an experience it's thing, It's the too. time that you were doing this. Yeah. You know, because, I mean, look, if everybody, if I stop learning tomorrow, sooner or later, Alan would catch up to me. You know, I don't know when it would be. Whoa, 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 <laughs> <I'm> just, whoa. <laughs> Slow down, cowboy. 2065? No, no. I don't think it'd be. No, but you know what I'm 20 saying? 20 anything. Like technology has to catch up. Yeah. It, it has to. And I don't know if it has 100%. All I said was it's gotten better. And I know that because this Blair software is, it, it is amazing what it can do uh, with regard to uh, engine dyno prediction and stuff like that. Well, I remember there was a guy, and I, I can't remember who it is, and I don't think that was the name of the software or, or the, the name of the author. I think so. Blair software is like 100 grand. It's this thing was substantial. It might have been Blair. And, you know, granted, you know, my perspective has changed, but substantial back then, I think it would have been 25. Well, it might have been back and then. And they were explaining, you know, the virtues of what this can actually do for you. <coughs> so we asked them, you know, what they needed to know to define exactly what a motor should make. They we back and forth for like two weeks. Mm-hmm all different stuff. And some of the stuff we had to measure and we had to get certain types of flow readings. And I mean, we needed very like valve area of dish. We had to talk to me, you know, sure. of, of backside yeah, yeah, of yeah, area. Yeah. I mean, they really got down to the nitty gritty. And back then, <clears throat> you know, my father gave them all the information and we didn't fudge anything. Mm-hmm. Gave them every, I mean, rod weight, everything. Bolt weight. Yeah. Well, probably want to know if they were all the same too. Yeah. Key, key factor. Yeah. Uh, we fed them all the information and they wanted to know, you know, any, anything that we could tell them additional about this. We're like nothing like this is what it is. They came back. They said an NHRA super stock 454 motor, the low compression one, like, uh, I think they were rated like a, a 10 to one motor, um, should make like 728 in that neighborhood plus mm-hmm. or minus 2%, 815. So, I mean, when, when you went through all that aggravation to now get a number that ain't even close. Yeah. So they were close, low. They weren't. They were low. They, they now, were almost, low. most of them seemed to be low. I would imagine if you played with the numbers, you'd figure stuff out. I wonder out. why that is though. I would have thought it'd be the other way. No, because a motor like that should not make what it makes. It really shouldn't. Yeah, but it does. It does. I mean, you're, you're talking about a stock volume head, stock compression. Yeah, I know. But, and the things turn 8,500. Yeah, but that's all the shit that they could, that they could um, program for. Mm-hmm. It's, but, it's, but you're not telling them how high you're shifting it. You're just giving them the parameters. Mm-hmm. And this is what it, so I mean, we don't tell them, okay, look, the motor is allowed to turn this or how high you could turn it. Give us the, the parameters that you're using and we'll tell you what the motor should make. And I'm not going to say they haven't gotten better. I'd love to talk to somebody that could do this, that could yeah i don't know who that would be maybe paul would know we're gonna be asking him a lot of shit like he's the smartest guy on earth and he's and he's just gonna want to be funny <laughs> well i mean he's look, a funny dude that, that's fine and it sounds to me like from you know the, the shenanigans i've heard yeah. he's he's been involved with i, I think we're gonna have a good time with paul. yeah he's pretty smart but but like one of those guys all i'm saying is practical experience like the guy's asking about dynamic impression i, I don't have an answer for you I, I know that in the end. I think you did answer him. I think he was asking about dynamic versus uh, versus static. Well, but, but either one doesn't drive it. A perfect example is that. Look at a two-stroke. Yeah. No, but what, I, all right, look, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. I, th- I think maybe what he was asking, and maybe he'll, he'll define it a little better um, now, what, you know, what the differences are. Like you put in your, you put in what you said, the 400 small block. Yeah. It should have 10 to 1 compression. And you put a tiny cam in it and you put a, you don't realize that you put a 283 head on it. And it detonates with three degrees of lead. And you're like, what the yeah, hell's going yeah, on? Yeah. It's yeah. got 14 to one. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's what happens. It's, it's, uh, it's how the air essentially gets in and out oh. over, over the time, over the time period. Yep. So that's really what, and the two strokes, they become crazy with that stuff. They talk about like static, but it's not really called static. And then they, they work, I think entirely on dynamic. You know, how they're ported and everything else. I, I, don't I know. know nothing about them. By the way, yes. sorry to interrupt again, but did you guys see on YouTube the uh, the guys that put the the glass cylinder head yeah. on the Briggs? I saw one one better. The one he did the glass, then he used methanol, and then he used acetylene to try to, like, 
view oh, I, I didn't see that, but I'll glass that cylinder up. head on a Briggs and Stratton to show the combustion event. Was that old? Would, I don't know. No, no, it's was, no. no, it was like a 4,000 <laughs> frame per second camera. Is that those guys that do everything slow? Yeah. Like they're well, called the, slow-mo guys or something? There's one guy that's got, he did the multi-fuels. This one is uh, a jet from uh, Japan, I think. Uh, well, some guy, there's some guy. No, I mean, it and, wasn't, and, wasn't that guy. And, yeah, because they get caught in these YouTube loops and, and the, always end up back to car yeah. chases with motorcycles uh, and, and guys did you ever get, wheelies. I, I just got, I just got ended up in uh, the guy that crushes everything <laughs> with, with the, like, he's got like a hundred ton press. No, yeah. I didn't, I didn't don't that. don't do it it's <laughs> crazy man <laughs> he just crushes shit i'm telling you it doesn't he matter got, so he gets some mad views whatever i'm looking at i end up back to people acting like idiots on motorcycles and groups getting chased by the cops why don't we uh get yes. this guy I, see we have a I think he's the compression guy the compression guy the guy th- that asked the question i hope he is yo buddy you on here are you there i should say <laughs> yep i'm here what's up were you the guy asking a question I was. I don't know. Oh, guys, is it good? Can you guys hear me? We're not yeah. smart. What do you think? We're smart. <laughs> we're just funny. <laughs> or we think we're funny. Well, Maybe we're not even funny. We could be. Sm- you guys can be smart for a few minutes, anyways, right? All right, have at it. So, so you- my question was to be: if you have an engine <laughs> that is hypothetically nine and a half to one, that's what the engine builder built it for, and you're trying to decide on. When the engine is already running, you you got a camshaft and all that stuff, and everything's good to go. You already picked everything out. And the engine is running, and you're trying to see if idle vacuum, as when you're tuning it, is in the right place versus what the camshaft is. And also, if if you have a problem, if you can go after it in looking at actual static cranking compression that the camshaft is making can you just use that number to find out if everything is right or if it's working or if it's not working well kind of where i'm at what's the pro what is the problem dave right yes is there a problem that's that's uh you know presenting itself okay so i'll give you I'll, i'll give you what it is it's a it's a 588 big block chevy um it had an F3 139 Pro Charger on it. It was fuel injected. Um, we've had this camshaft for a long time from a very reputable supplier. Um, and what we're trying to do now is we're trying to get into a, a better scenario with the camshaft because we believe that the power that we are making should have been more, I guess, it should have been more, basically. Um, Hmm. And we're looking at the camshaft part of it because it just seems to be something that we haven't really looked into because it's, we kind of gave it to the guy that does camshafts and we just let him run with it. We told well, him what it, we had, we told him we wanted to do it and he made it, but we, we don't show a lot of vacuum at idle. Um, we don't have a lot of, a uh, lot of cranking compression. Um, I'll give you a number. What's a lot. Yeah. Probably like one thirty. 130, 140, it's not a lot. Um, and the cam's incorrectly? Fresh motor. The, What's that? It's a fresh motor? Has it, It's been run or it's still on the engine stand? This has been something, this is like a five-year deal that we've had this camshaft. So it's been rebuilt, put back together, ran, made all kinds of horsepower, put back back down, um, broken, repaired. I mean, all, all, I got all kinds of history with it. Oh. Okay, well, this is this is going to be the the phrase that my father always said to me. It's not the tail lights. What what <laughs> did you what did you change that now you're questioning the camshaft? Did the displacement of the engine come up? No. Um. The, well, th- technically, the engine displacement went from a five ninety eight to a six thirty two, back down to a five eighty eight now. So it's went up, down, up, down. And it always had the supercharger on it? Fourth. Yes, it's always had the F3. Yep. So uh, just this this go round, you ha- you're you having a problem making power? Well, uh, we do uh, to a certain point. The difference of it now is that we got rid of the Pro Charger, and now we are going twin turbos. And we're going to do a different camshaft profile. Um, well, is, is this this a drag race only thing? Is that what this is? Is it race only? This is a drag race only. Yep. Okay. This was something that we did drive on the street. Um, 
But and that's where we noticed a lot of the vacuum problems, a lot of the runnability, a lot of the the little things that you don't ever really notice unless you drive the car a lot where it's at low RPM, coming off idle, stuff like that where you do when you're on the street. Yeah. And this is obviously a big inch motor. Um it's got eighteen degree cheap um, big chief heads on it. They're monster ported. I mean, the things, um, and handle a lot of air. We'll say that. <laughs> well, I, I, I would tell you this, that if I was presented with kind of a problem like this, you know, where like, like a drivability issue, if that was my main thing, um, <clears throat> this is something that I will tell most people at the drop of a hat because I'm pretty good at being a dick <laughs> and I'm not trying to be a dick to you, but I mean, I'll just tell somebody kind of what I'm thinking. Um, big difference between street car and race car. If you're going to be dual purpose and you're going to, you find a place that you want to be, you have to decide what's more important to you, street ability or race ability. With that being said, as far as power level goes, uh, I have said quite candidly that I did not know what I would do for a camshaft. Even in, in my own, like talking about my own motor, I have, uh, I, re I mean, I have an idea, I have my thoughts, but am I a turbo or a forced induction cam guy? No. No, we're going to be talking to people. Yes, we will. Because I have to talk. This is the best thing about this industry is being able to talk to people that have the experience that you don't have and, and work from their experience. When I, I would tell you this, that my experience back <coughs> when the superchargers like you know, Vortec, Paxton, ATI were not as big as they needed to be. I found that we made more and more power with a camshaft that would go against what people thought. Because uh, people were applying like turbocharger technology and overlap thoughts to a camshaft mm -hmm. for those superchargers. Not the case from what I found on the dyno. And I believe not the case <clears throat> with what some other very good people found on the dyno. That like they went from you know, what they considered a big cam for a supercharger. And then all of a sudden they're into something that's like 278 at 50. Mm -hmm. And they're like, this thing made so much more power. Well, yeah, dummy. Uh, so uh, I would be very hesitant to give you advice, but I can tell you this, that somebody that I talk to um, on a fairly regular basis uses camshaft ideas and principles that are much more conventional than you would think for a turbo car. They haven't, they haven't gone like some crazy center line direction or some crazy size direction that w what I have been told by somebody that I trust is that camshaft profiles, I'm not going to tell you they don't change substantially, but they don't change as much as you would think. So being with all that being said, what you have for a camshaft now, if you're asking, should it work with a turbocharger? Anything's going to run, but it depends what your goal is. Are you trying to make it run and be streetable? Or are you just trying to make balls out power? I mean, I mean, what are you really trying to do here? And we actually have Scott Clark on the line who might have some input. Let me get Scott in. Hold on. Yep. All right. Now I got to make sure I don't fuck this up. Hold on. Cause it'll hang up on a guy. Hold on. All right. He's got the little locky guy. Scott, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. Sure. How you doing, buddy? Cool. No, I had questions. Good. How are you guys doing? I just, I wanted to ask this guy, uh, but, you know, it sounds like he may need some troubleshooting help because it's really odd for any cam manufacturer to give you a bad cam for the application. So if it's if it's I down on power, I, I was curious at whatever, what else has he looked at? Like when he says idle vacuum, did you work on the tune to maximize the idle vacuum? Well, I, I think what he's saying, Scott, is he's had this cam for a while that it's always been the same. And then through the various changes he's made to the motor, it... He's second guessing the cam now, correct? How does he know that it's right. not on power? Or I guess what method are we using? Um, basically, uh, a lot of math to it. Um, some other combinations that have been familiar, and uh, you know, doing somewhat of the same thing. Um, I, it, it's been a long road of of a lot of research, a lot of reading, uh, a lot of different scenarios. Some other examples that we locally have. That are, I mean, I guess my question is, are you same. taking it to a chassis dyno or are you taking it to the track? Is this a mile per hour number that's down? What, what exactly makes you think it's down? Or it, it, it's all three, all three things. Um, I believe that there is some, some problems with, uh, for how much lift that the cam actually has, 
uh-huh. versus what we would actually need or use, I think is too far gone. So what I think is happening is it, it it's like the events are happening at the wrong times and or they're way too big. Um, this the profile of this camshaft, according to the cam card, is somewhere in the 900 and some lift range with one seven yeah. ratio rockers on it. So right. um, if you do the math, that is over an inch. So uh, it's it just seems like the way that the motor runs, it doesn't make a lot of actual cranking compression for it to run with a lot of vacuum. So it seems like once it comes up off of idle and, and gets up and running, everything seems to be really happy. Well, let me let me interject with a few things here. This scenario, but uh, the the as far as lift goes, I mean everybody's going to have their own theory. Um, my theory is the only time lift becomes a problem is if you're getting into a bad area of the cylinder head. I mean, and that and people and this is you know right. this is again this is opinion. This is where people be like, oh, Mike's a fucking idiot. Uh, maybe. But well, it's really not opinion. I, I would tell you that Lyft, uh, I remember when it used to make me and Pop crazy when somebody come in, yeah, I got a 650 Lyft cam. Yeah, how big is it? 650. No. <laughs> the the event location, duration advertised, duration at 50, duration at 200, tells you much more of the picture than than the Lyft does. So that that's probably, you know, the events, and you said that, and I agree with that completely, are the things you need to look at for how a motor profiles. The the events are going to be the most important thing. The the lift, I guess the easiest way to look at it is if you have enough, you're good, and too much is only a problem if the head has a problem with it. That's really the only time, in my opinion. Right. So continue. Just is you know, this in a I running mean, car? I kind of I missed the point, but I wanted to know is this in a car that's running right now and the engine just seems fast? Or uh is it something it, it wasn't still? No, it was in a running car for a lot of years. Um, we've with this same we've made we've what's that with the same exact blower uh, or what? What did you change recently that makes you? You just think because it's an old cam profile, it might be off base a little bit. I guess I'm trying to understand if we're solving a problem with a car that's. Blown. I mean, I I want to ask questions like. Uh, what about intercooler efficiency? I recently learned about this by guys that are measuring pressure before and after the intercooler, that the wrong intercooler on a blower combo can absolutely just kill power. Uh, so, I, you know, I just I was curious if it was a, a power problem. I was going to suggest make sure you're, you're checking up under every stone because, you know, um, unless this is a really old spec cam, it would be really weird for the cam to be the entire problem. These days. How long has this thing been together, David? How long has it been together now? Uh, five years. Oh, so it's never come apart uh, for a rebuild. No, it's come. No, it's come apart a lot. <clears throat> okay. now, I remember it went okay. from a ninety to a six thirty. Okay, okay. Down well, that's what I'm asking you. When's the last time it was put? It was redone. Um. And how many? How much time year. is on it? Every year. How much time is on it now? None. It's a bare, it's a brand new motor right now. That's why we're kind of we're looking into the options right now because it's the time to do it. Make the change. Um. You know, figure out where it's going to be. Oh, so you don't know if it's down on power? We don't know that it's down on power, but it's the exact same parts except for the fact of it's going to have twin 94 millimeters on it now instead of the F3R. Well, I, I mean, see, I would tell you that that's, that's kind of where we get into, you know, let's say, let's do this a few things. Cranking compression and stuff like that, great. How good's your your starter? Does your What's your battery charge? Um, there, there's right. oh, yeah, Are the rings in yet? Variable. Yeah, yeah, the rings. I mean, like, wait, now hold on. Let me just go take a step back. These idiots at the racetrack, they wanted to pump motors to figure out displacement. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you go over to a guy who's got a good 18 volt battery in his car, or, you know, which some of the circle track guys did for ignition stuff. So they'd run the whole system at 18 volts. Well, oh my God. You know, you'd say, well, your motor's 900 inches. No, it's not. And what would that do? That would change your cranking number, just like your static and dynamic compression changes or your dynamic changes over RPM. So uh, I'm I'm not going to tell you not to give any credibility to the starter, uh, you know, cranking compression deal, but I don't think it's one that you should really focus and home in on. I I would tell you that you're basically asking is the camshaft you have because lift is particularly large, will it be okay going from a blower to turbos? Um, I know I, it's not. I know it's not. I'm I, I'm not worried about right. that. I'm just trying to figure out the mechanical part of it. 
to be where when we put this thing back together, if it's going to answer a lot of questions that we've had for a while now, being that we're not engine builders. You know what I mean? We're we're not set. We're we're telling the engine builder we want this done. It wants to be this, this, and this. We're going to try to do this with it. Do your thing. Well, so thing is in your court. Give us back something that will work. And that hasn't really happened to our liking to what we have tried to make. David, let me let me David. This is Tom. Let me make you an offer here because I don't know that any of us. Uh, actually, I do know that we're not going to be able to answer your question here because there's way too many variables. Um, why don't we do this? Uh, you know, I know, and Mike knows a lot of, uh, big turbo engine builders. I mean, my, we're friends, we're personal friends with one of the fastest cars, you know, on earth. So, um, Ooh. Anthony. Oh yeah. He knows a little, <laughs> I know. he knows a little bit. <laughs> Who? Yeah. Why don't you, um, message us, uh, on Tad, what's our, our Facebook thing? <laughs> Which one? The fan page or our main page? Oh my God. Uh, look us up on Facebook, Power and Speed. Power and Speed. I was just trying to get you in there, buddy. Oh, thanks, Gee. Um, send us a message with all the all the specifics of the engine, and we'll get some ca- some recommended cam specs for you. How about that? To put you in a starting point. That'd be great. Yep, that'd be great. And it'll be yep. probably probably better than a starting point if we talk to Anthony. He'll he'll probably be able to zero it in pretty damn close. Yeah, and I, I mean, I I at some point wanted to talk to him just to get his theories on what he found. We got to get him back on anyway. We we really should. We, we'll just get him in here. From a technical perspective, when he's switching to turbochargers, what he's going to need is a cam that provides more efficiency at a lower RPM, which helps get the two turbos to school. Something that's got a more of a mid-range torque style cam that will hang on at the top end as much as possible. Yeah, you need you need you need a certain amount of low end efficiency to get the cam the the turbochargers to work. Like in other words, if you had a right. a, a comp eliminator or a pro stock cam. The thing would never want to get the turbos up. Yeah, yeah I understand that. Too soggy in the mid range up against the converter to try and light the turbos off, right? Yep. Well, Anthony will, he's a wizard at all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Man, what an awesome show. You guys are going to give him cam specs. I was just going to say, <laughs> uh, keep, you know, call a cam manufacturer and, and pick the one when you know you're talking to the right guy who's asking you about your parts combination. It's very hard to get the right guy. Yeah. yeah. Because a lot of times you're asking those questions and they're just flipping through the same catalog you're looking at. And they're like, uh, this one. See, that's the, be- the beauty of our show. You know, we've been in this a long time. And if we don't know something, which is, you know, it's often nobody knows everything. We do know who to go to for. I've always gone to you that have helped a lot. You know, I think you get a lot of feedback from customers when you get their way. So, I, yeah, just find the guy and stick with it over time. Well, send me that info and uh, we'll, we will definitely get you some specs. But try to be as clear as you can, you know. Born stroke, um, you know, cylinder head, all that stuff. And that's where we were kind of at in the beginning. Um, this was this was done by a guy that was very, um, very knowledgeable. Has made a lot of horsepower. Um, he's one of the leaders in in boosted application stuff, and he, um, we were really confident in the whole time. So it was kind of one of them things that was just out of sight, out of mind because. It always mechanically worked good, um, you know, and did its thing. We, we had uh, pretty decent valve train stuff for, like, geometry and longevity and, you know, kind of low maintenance. We had a little bit of stuff here and there we had issues with. We are also twisting this motor. It would, it would touch over 8,000 sometimes. And you kind of get some, a lot of stuff moving around with something that big, that much lift. You know, that, that situation isn't nothing to worry about. Um, for the maintenance side of it, we were aware of it, so it was fine. But now that we're switching the power adder, we'd like to really look into it more, figure out the mechanical side of it more, try to understand it, and you know, see if there's other things about what we've already experienced that stand out that we can put into selecting the next camshaft for it. Well, I mean, I, I think the best way, and I'm sure Scott will agree with me, the best way to select a camshaft for something like this is somebody who's done something similar exactly. that has a lot of experience with, like, something along like your particular line of packages it doesn't have to be exact but i mean Which you wouldn't exactly who we bought it from first but yeah well i mean you and but you you, know. you wouldn't want to go ask a guy that does hondas uh, for a camshaft recommendation for your 632 or 588 or whatever i mean you want somebody that's in the same general range like you'd like a guy that uses a non-standard big block head to build bigger inch motors yep. with turbos yep what's your package yep and then of course part of this is customer expectation 
you if you have a certain amount of drivability in mind or a certain amount of characteristics in mind that all has to be factored in too you know when you when you ask the guy to make the yeah like it's a race car right everybody's got a different idea of what sh- what yep, a yep. nicely mannered yeah. car is <clears throat> yep it's gonna be a race one car. thing it's- here guys sorry to interrupt but uh if you're depending on what data logger or your system you're using something that'll help your cam guy is getting back pressure exhaust back pressure data from your turbocharger system you mm. might just start with the cam you have go out and make some light passes you know 20 pounds of boost and see what your drive pressure ratio is on that combo that helps a guy pick cam events as well mm-hmm. it's good advice i think yeah i think i think it's been a possibility the 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 toughest part is to put it all together and and to put the you know the effort into doing that the timeline kind of runs out um so we're just gonna David, I, I would bet that it deals. We, we've already voted off, so we're, we're going to just make the new build and and go after it however we can. And David, our guy will get you. Measurements and sorry, our guy will get you very close. I, I guarantee that this is what he does for a living. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, All right, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'll definitely get you some information. Yeah, get us some information. Yeah, Scott, hang on here a second because I want to I want to talk to you. But thanks for calling, David. Appreciate it. You you bet. See ya. Thanks. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks, man. Bye. You're welcome. Hey, man. How's uh, how's your event? Filling up? Uh, Yeah. Yeah, it's doing really good. It's uh, a little over half full, it looks like. All right, well. coming home from my Kansas City class today. All right, well, while you're on uh, on here, plug your plug your event so everybody knows to get there. March 4th and 5th at Fox Performance in Sigmarville, New Jersey. Yep. Uh, it's a two-day class. Uh, 550 bucks, and you can contact me at Scott B. Clark, that's D as in David, Scott B. Clark at Yahoo.com. Just send an email say you're interested in the class. That's the one in your neck of the woods. I got one in Springfield, March 3rd, I believe, 3rd and 4th, uh, Missouri, uh, at Blake Hughes, 417 Motorsports. We got some open there. Um, Oklahoma City class is full up. Okay. But anyway, that's what's going on. I didn't call in to advertise. I just wanted to hear about that guy's story with the cam. No, yeah, me too. And I, I was trying to get a feel for it, but you know what it is? This is, you, you end up going like two different directions. Like the guy, first he's talking about yeah. street abilities, talking about vacuum, but then he's talking about overall performance. And, you know, what I always found is that there's a, a wide range of what somebody would consider streetable. Oh, yeah. You know, Alan, you know, <clears throat> Fudd, the, the knucklehead, he drives something around that is just atrocious. Whereas I would prefer something much more refined and you know, it's, it's what you can prefer, you know, it's what you can tolerate. So I can hear your route 44 yeah, order at say, Sonic. That's why I say get advice from a really good camp guy. Yeah. You know, and they're out there. You just got to get to know them and you got to, you know, if you're going to spend their time then buy product from them. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, we're definitely going to see you in March and then you're going to come back yeah. up here, but you know, Hey, I'll be in touch with you guys. I will be down there and I'll, I'll be attending and I think it'll be a lot of fun. Yes. No autographs, please. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, Scott. Take it easy. All right, guys. See you. See right, thanks. And we got a, uh, what's what? his name here? Yo, buddy. What's up? What's up, fellas? Sorry. I saw you called before. We were talking about something. And I looked back and you were gone. Uh, yeah, I, I'm actually at work. So I had to, I had to bail out and get back to work, you know, do the things that they pay me to do. <laughs> <laughs> Always gets in the way. Yeah, I know. Uh, no, I was. I'm working on my. I was working on my pickup, and I got that dirt motor. And he has, you know, a very, very good mechanical pump. You know, the 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 push rod type. Yeah. Mechanical pump. And I was thinking to myself, well, do I stay with the mechanical pump, or do I just go with the electric pump, like a a good, healthy size electric pump? I, I would tell you, and then we're, you're going to be the call to close the show because, Tom, I know he's got to go because he's probably not used to our shows running a little longer than they have been. Um, I would tell you this, that a pump is always a better pusher than a puller, always. Um, yeah. I would tell you that the difference be- excuse me, between a circle track car and a drag car is, or something, even a street car, it's going to accelerate hard. They don't. They don't fight the g-force on acceleration that a drag car does. They don't have to overcome the column of fuel, like or you know whether you're sucking that column or pushing that column um, on a launch or hard acceleration. You have to you have to counteract that force in order to keep your fuel pressure effectively in your flow, which you'd like it to be to the motor. You don't have those forces on a circle track car. 
further, uh, circle track cars generally are plumbed correctly, big lines, everything is right. I, I would never, for me personally, if I had my choice, run a mechanical pump. That would just be me. Now, uh, and then I don't want people to see, oh, what are you talking about? If you've got an injection system, like a mechanical injection system, and there's a reason you want to do that, certainly. We get into those things that it's absolutely correct. But I would tell you for a street car or a mild drag car, I would much prefer to see an electric pump. My thought. Yeah, I was I was thinking about it and just the, the, the well, like the, the aeromotive system that they have, like the, the aeromotive A2000 pump. I mean, it's it's a huge pump and it's, you know, well more than enough fuel, but fuel injected or carbureted, just going to be it. It's see, that's the thing I wanted to tell you was it's going to be carbureted to start, right? But I plan on doing converting it over to fuel injection just so that way I can fuck around with it. Yeah, I've never messed with. I've never really done my own EFI stuff. Well, none of it's pretty hard, and all, all this it's, stuff now, like, are pretty. None of it's none of it's very hard. The the stuff they have now, like the the kits, like from Holly, and with the amount of online resources and people, oh yeah, that you can listen to, like Scott Clark, <laughs> you know, and but R- it's, R- it's, it's kind of got to be electric, though. Yeah, yeah, it's well, go that way. I, I would tell you, but uh, you know, and and this is uh, again when people like when Alan was saying, well, what fuel pump should I have? How the fuck do I know? Uh, I I mean, when you've got all these different brands, and and everybody's got to realize, I don't build motors anymore unless it's for me or my brother. So, I mean, certain things like fuel pumps and like Aeromotive, I know they're a company. I know they're out there. Um, look, when I was doing electronic injected stuff, there wasn't much like that other than like a Weldon was like the only good big pump you could put on. So we ended up using like a uh, Bosch pumps and would use a pair of them. And, you know, yeah. that's, that, that's the school I'm from, but I don't, I mean, so I would tell you this, a tank in the back, close to the cell, preferably a sump, so it helps feed the pump. Because again, pumps are better pushers and pullers. If you can remove any any restriction going into the pumps, always a better thing. Um, but I mean, now you're going to get into the the pumps that Aeromotive make. Do you buy a return style regulator to work with a carburetor, and then later move it to a different regulator for fuel injection? I don't know. Question for air motive. Well, I'm going to do a return style just because of the fact eventually it, it's going to go EFI and and boost. So I might as it's buy you know buy it once cry once. So I'm just going to get it done. Yeah, I I, I would put a the electric. I put the electric in it. Just make sure it's something that the pump is capable of making the Supporting. pressure that you want, so it could work on both sides. That's what I do. Electric. All right. All right. All right. Well, you guys have fun and uh, enjoy this wonderful weather we're having. Oh, yeah. Mm, yeah, beautiful. Lovely. <laughs> All right, buddy. I'll see you. Yeah. See you, man. Later. Actually, with what he just said, Matt just posted he's out there stripping the motor apart in the rain out of that truck. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. He's uh, a sloppy mechanic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, either that or he got hit on the head. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's crappy here. Crappy. And mm-hmm. one last thing, too, before we take off, because I had a guy contact us this morning, uh, Matt. Mm-hmm. I mean, sorry, Mark uh, Hadley from the UK. Yeah, that was interesting. And now, he, asked, he asked a question that Tom's going to be able to answer later, and one that asked me to find out about Andy Frost, if he's going to be coming back to America for any top speed, you know, the... Well, that's... Well, what, how, I know. mean, it's it's worth touching on a few things before mm-hmm. we go. Tom has his headphones half off, so I guess he's ready to run out the door. <laughs> um, no, no, no. I'm just... I'm comfortable, actually. He's got the look. I got to go, but but yeah, I'm good. Need the camera on you tonight. So many things I could say right this moment about what I'm looking <laughs> at, but I just I just can't. Well, because my headphones on? Word. Nothing. 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 <laughs> Um, my volume's still good. We we have people Wait, listening in the UK. Another one. <laughs> we have people listening in the UK, which is yeah. pretty multiple interesting. People, so yeah. yeah. And I mean, I honestly, I haven't looked at the maps to show where people get Jeremy are Clarkson to call us. You know, then you're, then you're number one with us. Oof. Yeah, I, I don't know that that would happen, Todd. Maybe not. <laughs> but that that particular guy, he came to Drag Week apparently several times. Yeah, so, with that car. And yeah. you know, again, please, Drag Week guys, forgive me. I'm not a Drag Week historian. I yeah. haven't followed this. You know, from day one, this is my, I mean, honestly, I got interested because of guys like Jason mm-hmm. and, and the people that called in. It sounds like a hell of a lot of fun. I think it'll be a great experience. So I don't know the history of like Jason knew how many people were on this one and this one. And I, don't, I don't know. I, well, this guy Frost is on the opposite end of what we would be doing. He's one of the very fast. Well, classes. yeah. Yeah. He, but he drives it on the street. But too, still around. really <laughs> unique that somebody from the yeah. UK 
is doing comes what we all do. here. Come yeah. here to do this. So Very I mean, cool. He, shut us up. Yeah, he said there's people that listen over there or wh- whoever Ted was talking to, yeah. to yeah. or whatever. So, I mean, look, we're open to having UK people call in or arrange times to call in. I mean, I think that'd be excellent. Yeah, I if mean, they want to stay up. Well, I mean, you know, you, you look, time they're at you look at up. things like Top Gear and you see half these people are driving around in these goofy little cars that like we don't even know what the hell they are. <laughs> You know, and they're all on the wrong side of the road. Citrons or whatever. Yeah, well, you know, dumb shit like no, that. No, Mike likes little three-wheeled things, but. Well, yeah, like, but they don't have those things. That he, you know what I mean. But, I mean, they've got all kind of nondescript, little, tiny, itty-bitty cars. And, you know, like, I can't help but wonder, is there, <coughs> is there the level of enthusiasm for, like, go-fast street cars or drag cars in the UK or in places in Europe? Because it seems like they're all more towards, like, the touring cars. Yeah, and road well, you races. See, you even like see that. the stuff on YouTube in Russia doing it, you know on airstrips and stuff like that so it's i guess it goes around the world yeah hot rodding's a disease I, I'd, li- I'd like to hear the perspective you know from somebody say in the uk yeah, yeah. it'd be cool I, I think that'd be neat well we'll try to uh, i'll i'll reply to that guy and see if he can get the frost on and, right, the, and, and the yeah. other the other guy will will happen all right well last thing yep we're gonna have for sure uh paul yaw injector dynamics next week yep i will start cool. publicizing that probably tomorrow night Yep. So that the links can be shared and moved around. And this is, like I said, this is a good opportunity. If you got questions, you know, injector questions in particular, he'd probably be a really good guy to ask that question to. Yep. Probably the best you could get, I would imagine. I couldn't imagine anybody better. So I, I think I think you should, if you got questions, uh, either get them into us. And Tad has actually taken a, a pretty yeah good handle on the Kill social it. media side. Because, I, I mean, honestly, I, I hardly ever look at it. Unless I'm, usually, you know, why I look at it. I look at it to go hate on somebody. It's like Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, last uh, thing. Did you see? Put that picture up. Which picture? The picture I sent to oh, you yes. from Dale Jr. Yeah, I saw it. Oh, that yeah, was yeah, pretty that. funny. Yeah, that was good. There's a there's a picture uh, that we're putting on Facebook. Go check that out. And <laughs> that was cool. We'll put we'll put more about the story behind that picture. That's pretty neat. So, all right. Anything else? Anybody can think of? Yeah, Jeff. No, Jeff want, Jeff's ready to order a uh, rotating assembly. Jeff who? Hester. Oh yeah, yeah, he told me yeah, he told me he was ready. And I and Jeff, I know. I gotta call J C. I know. FUD called him the other day. <laughs> FUD called who? J C. Oh boy. So I, I think he's waiting for a call back, so don't 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 <laughs> cock block him. Let him <laughs> let him get his parts. Come on, man. You leave the poor guy alone. All right. So I managed to hit the outro music correctly. Good. Nice. Yay. It's the right song. All right, so next week, uh, I'll be back Monday night, 7 o'clock. Oh, yeah. Paul, yeah. That should be a very good show. See ya. Good night, y'all. Bye.